Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we really do have a living hope for the future, which nothing can destroy. And even death has lost its power to hurt us. We pray, therefore, that you will teach us this evening not only how to live, but how to die. And especially we pray for those in our congregation who have recently lost loved ones, that tonight your word may lift their hearts into the light and the glory and the peace of your presence and promise. And now, Lord, be with my mouth, be with all our ears, and may your Holy Spirit turn all our attention to the one who gave us that living hope by bursting through the grave clothes, through the stone, by standing in the presence of his disciples and saying, Shalom, peace, peace be to you. Even in the name of Jesus, Amen. We finished the study of Ecclesiastes last Sunday evening, but I read it again this week. And tonight I want to give you a postscript to the studies in Ecclesiastes, a kind of contrast, a light passage to show just how dark was that Old Testament book. As I read through it again this week, the sentence that hit me again and again was, it is all useless, useless useless and I counted up how many times he said that and it was nearly 20 times in just a few pages that he said my life has been useless and yet he'd done everything that people want to do he tried everything people want to try and over the whole of his life he just wrote the word useless so I asked why why did you call your life so useless after you had done so much and experienced so many things and then I read it again and I noticed the other thing that he said most frequently and it was this. Who knows what will happen to us when we die? And again and again he said that thing. Don't know how many times he said it. And he finally concluded with a very sad picture of old age. And at the very end of that he gave us his own understanding as to what happens when we die. He said the body goes back to the ground from which it came and the breath goes back to the God who gave it. And by implication, both the body and the breath lose their identity. In other words, death means disintegration, oblivion. There is nothing. And the question that Job asked so many centuries ago, if a man die, shall he live again, receives the answer from Ecclesiastes, no, he doesn't. He may live on in people's memories. He may live on in his offspring. He may live on in the influence of his work. But if you ask of that dead man, does he have any more conscious experience? Does he relate to the world around him anymore? Is he able to communicate with other persons? The answer of Ecclesiastes is no. He can't even praise God. And if you give that answer to the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? If you say no, then the whole of life has written across it, useless. But if you can find a different answer, you're going to have a different purpose and a different meaning to life itself. Now, there are basically four different answers to the question as to what happens after we die. And here are the four. I've already given you one. Disintegration. That is the end of you. Your body will disappear into the earth and your spirit will disappear somewhere into the God of the universe who gave it and you as a self-conscious identity cease to be. That's answer number one. Answer number two is this, that your soul will survive without a body and that you will go floating on as some spook, some ghost, some vague thing. And once again, there are those who believe that even if the soul does survive the body, that the soul will lose its identity. The favorite picture from some outlooks of this kind is that the body is like a glass full of water which represents the human soul and that if you take that glass of water and smash it on the rocks of the seashore, the glass breaks, which is the end of your body, 
and the spirit flows into the sea where it gets lost and once again there is the loss of the individual identity and this is why though the Greeks used to believe that the soul survived the body and that the body was a prison for the soul and that when the body was smashed the soul was released nevertheless they were miserable about life after death because they felt that the soul would lose itself in the ocean the third answer which is becoming increasingly popular even in this country is reincarnation that your soul survives but in someone else's body and that you come back as someone else I've never been able to understand the appeal of this I don't want to come back as someone else and forget who I was and there are those who believe that you may come back as an animal if you haven't been very good in this life be kind to your four-footed friends a duck maybe somebody's mother or whatever the <laughs> there's a song something like that somewhere or else you keep coming back if you've been good and gradually you go higher up the social scale and maybe even one day you'll find yourself up in God that's reincarnation but there's a fourth answer which is quite different from all these the first answer your soul and your body disappear the second answer your body disappears but your soul goes marching on like John Brown's and yet can lose its identity in the great soul of the universe or as modern spiritism would teach keep its identity but as a spirit the third answer your soul comes back in another body maybe an animal maybe another person but reincarnation the fourth answer is the Christian one and that's why I recited the Apostles Creed at the beginning of the service I believe says the Christian in the resurrection of the body not in the immortality of the soul that's the Greek belief the Christian came into the world with something quite new so new that when Paul tried to talk about it in Athens they laughed him out of court and said resurrection of the body ridiculous it's the soul that goes marching on while your body lies a moldering in the grave and yet Paul said no I've come to tell you it's the body that rises from the dead now people have laughed at this idea from three angles there have been those who have said we can't believe it in the name of religion the Sadducees were like that in our Lord's day and they said we cannot believe in a resurrection of the body and it was they who put Jesus to death they would not have dared to put Jesus to death if they would believed in the resurrection of the body they thought that once they'd killed Jesus they'd got rid of him they said we don't believe that a body can rise from the dead and if we can kill this man on a cross and put his body in a tomb and seal it then that's the end of him and he cannot possibly come back because bodies don't rise and they were terribly wrong and some people have opposed it in the name of philosophy as the Athenians did when Paul tried to preach and some have opposed this in the name of science when you read Genesis 2 it says God took some dust and he breathed into it and there was a living body and I'm quite sure Magnus Magnuson believes that's myth I'm also sure that his son and daughter believe it's truth for they know the Lord Jesus but what we believe when we say I believe in the resurrection of the body is that we believe that God is going to repeat that millions of, of times over and take ashes and dust from the earth and make a, a living body again isn't that incredible but that's what we're saying when we say I believe in the resurrection of the body to many this is too materialistic of you they want heaven to be a very spiritual place and they want us to be in a state rather than a place but I'm so glad that heaven is so real that I can pinch myself and find out it's real and that heaven is not a state but a place and that I will be located in that place and that there will be a room for my body in the father's house that's exciting I'll not only be able to pinch myself to know that it's real I'll be able to pinch you and find out that you're real too and shake hands with you so for some it's too materialistic but the biggest objection to it is it's too miraculous too miraculous the scientist says it takes thousands if not millions of years for dust to evolve into a human living body he just can't believe that that could happen while you blinked your eyes and yet this is the glorious hope of the Christian and this chapter Paul is saying to the Corinthians whatever you do don't lose your grasp of this truth of the resurrection of the body don't get shaky on this because everything hangs on this if you could once prove that Jesus body 
was rotting somewhere in Palestine today, you would have finished Christianity and we'd have to close Millmead. There would be no point in us meeting here. That's why two Oxford dons many years ago set out to write a book to prove that Jesus did not rise physically from the dead. And they spent the entire summer vacation on their studies. And when they met each other at the end of the summer vacation to share and compare notes, one rather shamefacedly said to the other, I'm afraid I have to confess I have become a Christian. And the other said, you don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. <laughs> and they'd both been convinced by the evidence. And this is why Frank Morrison, a young law student, realizing that Christianity stood or fell by this one fact, did that body come out of that tomb, examined the evidence so thoroughly that the book he set out to write to disprove the resurrection was turned upside down or right way up, and he wrote another book called Who Moved the Stone by Frank Morris. You've read it perhaps, and he had to say it's true. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not risen from the dead physically, if his body didn't come out of that grave, then our preaching is a waste of time, your faith is a waste of time, and frankly, you ought to be the most miserable people on earth because you've got most to lose. And if you have no real hope beyond the grave, and having found all the blessings that you have found, then you really ought to be the most miserable. If you've only got hope in this life, then you really are in a terrible state. But now he begins to talk about the real thing, the future hope of the resurrection of the body. And he says some very simple things about it, and I just want to repeat them for your comfort. First of all, he says, why should you think it's strange for the same life to pass from one body into another? Why should you think that a strange idea? It's happening all the time. It's happening in your own back garden all the time. Why should it be so strange? Spring is coming. Life is coming up, isn't it? Isn't it exciting to see it? Where is that life coming from? It's coming because you buried something in the ground. And what you buried is going to die. You put a potato in, you put a, a grain of seed in, you put a, something in the ground, and that is going to rot. It'll be a husk and then it'll go back to the dust. But the life which it contained is going to come up out of that ground in a new life. And you accept that, and every one of you is going to, probably going to do something about it and plant something in your back garden this spring and expect it to come up in the autumn. Why should it seem strange to you, says Paul, when all the time your very life depends on burying something in the ground that will die, and from that life in that thing that will die will come a new form, a new body. Why should you think it's strange? Something that happens in your back garden can happen in your grave. There's a little village on the Thames, and I can't just think of it, maybe my wife will remember it, um, where lived an artist who painted a most marvelous picture of the village churchyard. Crookham, is it? Crookham. And the name of the artist? Sp Stanley Spencer. Got it. <laughs> if you go to Crookham, if you go to Cookham, go and see the paintings of Stanley Spencer. And look particularly for his painting of the village church. There it is, the village church and surrounding it the graveyard, only there's something very extraordinary happening. The stones are all lifting, and hands are reaching out, and faces are coming out. And there was Stanley Spencer looking at the graveyard and saying, it's a garden, and bodies have been planted there. Why should it be strange that it should be any different from any other garden? And that what you plant dies and goes to the dust, and from it there comes new life in a new form. It's the same life, but God has given it a different body. And he goes on to say, why should it seem strange to you that God should be able to make a variety of bodies for different environments? After all, you've only got to look around you to see that. God has given fish one kind of a body which is perfectly adapted to water. He's given birds another kind of body perfectly adapted to the air. He's given men and animals different kinds of bodies. And even when you look at human beings, there are no two bodies the same. God can make any kind of a body. Lift up your eyes to the skies and look at the stars tonight and realize there are no two stars alike. The heavenly bodies are so different in glory and God made every single one of them and there are millions upon millions of them. Why should it seem strange to you that God could create a different body for you, for a new environment? 
you know it's amazing it shows how obstinate our intellects are that we will not accept a simple truth that fits in with everything we can observe around us Paul moves on to say a little about how different our new bodies will be he says what you put in the ground is not the same as the life that comes maybe you've planted some bulbs and uh, now they're coming up what you put put in wasn't it a horrible old looking thing <laughs> dirty husky nothing very beautiful and you put it in and now crocuses hyacinths beautiful things coming out of that ugly thing and Paul says your new body is going to be as different from your present one and yet and yet there will be a connection he said look at your present bodies they are perishable my don't you notice that every six months you go to the dentist and your hair gets thinner and your skin gets drier somebody told me last week I was shrinking at the rate of what was it a tenth of a centimeter a year where's my informant gone a thirty of an inch that shows how I get my facts wrong thirty of an inch is that about the same but you're shrinking that much and this body of ours is perishable in fact you know it's only in its prime for a very short period and then it's it's over and you're declining in powers and you're decaying and this body of ours, says Paul, which we plant in the ground, this body of ours is a dishonoring one, it's a humiliating one. I think all of us, if we could, would swap some features with somebody else, wouldn't we? You can have my nose for a start. <laughs> it runs in the family, but you can have it. <laughs> and this body of our humiliation, and as it gets older, it humbles us more and more, as it gets weaker and weaker. And it's a body that is weak. It's a body that can be just taken away with a draft of air or a drop of dirty water. How weak, how dishonorable, how perishable this body is. Paul says, he calls it literally a psychic body, but the word that he uses, psychic, means it's an animal body. It's, it really has no advantages over your dog. This body of yours, it's subject to the same germs, the same pressures it's just an animal body it's a natural body but what is going to come from the dust and ashes of this body a body that will never perish think of that no baldness in heaven no teeth decay in heaven no disease in heaven no death a body that will be honorable you know the phrase radiant health don't you radiant health isn't that word significant radiant meaning glorious shining that's the new body and this body of ours which is sown a weak body is raised strong we'll be able to do everything we want to do in heaven doesn't that get you excited he uses another word for this kind of body and again the word misleads us today he says this will be a pneumatic body but in fact the word means a body that didn't come like the animal bodies came but a body that came from the Spirit of God and he says, in fact, every one of you gets your body from someone else. Every one of us here tonight got our body from some other person. In fact, all of us here tonight got our bodies from Adam, and he unfortunately stamped his progeny with certain features, one of which is he marked us all with death, and we begin to die the day we're born. Another is that our bodies that we got from him are made of the dust of the earth and that's where they go back. And there isn't a single chemical element in my body that you cannot find in the crust of the earth. That's where it came from, that's where it's going back to. And all that was stamped on me because I got my body from Adam. But one of the titles of our Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament is he is the last Adam, meaning he's a new a new progenitor of a new human race, a new humanity. And those who get their new bodies from him will have a bodies like his. And he was a man from heaven, not a man from earth. Do you know the word Adam literally means mud, clay. You came from the mud. And the body you got from Adam, you got from the mud, you got from the earth. And that's where it'll go back to the mud. But the body you get from Jesus the one who came from heaven is a body stamped with heaven and heaven has life written all over it, not death. 
And so, says Paul, there's just got to be a change. There is no shortcut to heaven. That's why death has to occur first. Can you imagine going into a perfect world with the body you've got at the moment? Would you like to do that? If I said I can take you right now, just as you are, straight to heaven, to a perfect universe with the body you've got now, would you come? A body that would get older and weaker? That wouldn't be heaven, would it? And so Paul says, can you not see that we've got to go through this process? We've got to have the earthly first, then the heavenly. We've got to have a natural body, and that's got to die and give way. Unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it remains alone. Nothing can come from it. And so there is no shortcut, and I have to live in this dying body. And it has to reach the end of its death. And then it is possible for me to have my new one. No shortcut. But that's God's plan for us. Now comes the great secret of all, and it really is such an incredible secret. Science could never have discovered it, and science cannot disprove it either, and only God could have revealed it. All sorts of questions are running around my mind now, as if I'd read this for the first time, that after death I can have a new, strong, beautiful body that will last me forever. When that truth comes, immediately I begin to ask, how long will it take that body to come? And, and when will I get it? And will some people get it before other people? And, and do we get it at the moment of death or, or when? And, and all kinds of questions come. And Paul, anticipating the question, says, now I'm going to tell you the big secret. It's a real secret. It's a mystery. Nobody's ever found out about this apart from here. It could never have been discovered. No scientist could have found it out by examining your body. No anatomist could have discovered this. The secret is that all of us will get our new bodies in the same minute. All of us. Nobody will get there ahead of the others. We'll all get our new bodies together. And if you want to know how quickly it will take, the answer is, don't blink or you'll miss it. Mind you, if you did happen just to blink at that moment, you would hear it because there'll be a trumpet blast loud enough to wake the dead. In fact, I wasn't quite right when I said we'll all get our new bodies in exactly the same moment. The dead will just get there first. They've been waiting after all. It also means one other delightful truth, and that is that since this will happen in one moment and God has already marked on his calendar the moment when this will occur, it means that one whole generation of Christians who will then be living on earth will not die. That's the great secret. We shall not all die. And every generation has the hope in their heart that they may be in that last generation. Think of it just like taking off an old suit and putting on a new one. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you hear a trumpet, you look down, and you've got a new body. What a surprise. But what a lovely one. What a lovely surprise from God to be in that last generation. But it doesn't really matter, does it? Whether we've departed and are at home with the Lord and absent from the body, or whether we're still among those who are called the quick in the creed, those who are still alive on earth. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, Handel was so struck with this great secret that he just had to include it in the Messiah. It is so fundamental to the Christian hope, and it changes one whole outlook on life. Even if I'm not in that last generation, I'll be there first, and they'll catch up with me. And we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now I come to this conclusion. And this is where, this is all a postscript to Ecclesiastes by way of contrast to it. If you really believe what I've been telling you, then there are just three quite profound yet very practical implications. And they are these. First, this assures you of your identity in the next life. You will not be a vague spirit. You will have your very own body. You will be you. 
Jesus has been this way before. That's why we're so sure it's going to happen. It's already happened to one person. And for three days and three nights, he was spirit without a body. But he got his body back on the third day. And then he said, look, it is I myself. His identity was assured. And he said, give me some fish to eat. Come and touch my hands. Put your, put your hand into my side, Thomas. Come and feel me. Give me something to eat. And then you'll be quite sure it's I myself. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones. I'm me. I'm myself. And if there's one thing belief in the resurrection of the body does, it is to assure of us of our identity in the next life that I shall be I myself and you will be you yourself and he will be he himself. The second thing it does is to assure you of the continuity between this life and the next. Different bodies but the same life passing from one to the other. The continuity that you have in your garden when you plant the seed, it is the same life in that seed or that bulb that is in the flower or the vegetable that comes from it, the same life. And the resurrection of the body assures us that there is a continuity between this life and the next. Not reincarnation which teaches me a discontinuity in which I'm one person here and another person there, but to believe in the resurrection of the body for me is to believe in the continuity between this life and the next. So the first assurance is my identity in the next life. The second assurance is the continuity between this life and the next, but the third and the final assurance is the validity of this life. I mean by that that if you really believe in the resurrection of the body, you can no longer write over anything that you do in this life useless, provided it is done in the Lord. No longer is that dis there that despair, that disillusion with this world, saying, what's the point? Is it worthwhile? Why bother? The resurrection of the body says, it is all worthwhile. And so Paul, at the end of this chapter, comes right down to earth with a big bump. After a defiant shout, Death, you have not had the last word. Death, you have now died. On the day when I rise from the dead and get my new body, on that day, death finally dies. And death is destroyed. And we can shout defiantly, triumphantly, Death, you can no longer hurt me. Death, you can no longer separate the parts of me. Death, you can no longer do this to me. Oh, grave, where is your victory? But then you come right back down to earth and you say, therefore, therefore, you can believe that what you do in the Lord's service in this body has eternal significance and is so important and worthwhile that your life is no longer useless. Now, let me say something here that's going to be rather important. I have the feeling that some people read this verse to mean whatever you do spiritually, know that whatever you do in the Lord is not useless, says Paul. And so people think that means what I do in church, or that means what missionaries do, or that means what ministers do. Nothing of the kind. It means whatever you do in this body, which is in the Lord. And that includes your daily work, it included for Jesus 18 years in a carpenter's shop making chairs and tables, and I'm sure he was doing that in the Lord. And it means your work, your leisure, your marriage, it means everything. Whatever you do in the Lord is worthwhile. It's not useless. Provided it's in the Lord, it's helping to build and to shape something that will last forever. It's making a life that will pass on into a new body and continue afterwards. Do you see that? And suddenly even your daily work becomes worthwhile. You know, funnily enough, the world looks at Christians and they look at all our busyness and all our activities and all our efforts and they say, you know, we're amazed that you think it's worthwhile. You don't make many converts. You don't get very far. Worthwhile? Look, it's we who look at them and say, all that you do is useless. Because you're building on nothing and nothing of it will last. But everything that's done in the Lord will last. 
And that word useless is there. Nothing you do in the Lord is ever useless. The literal Greek means nothing you do in the Lord will not be paid for. That's two negatives I know, but that's the literal Greek. And it means there will be wages, there will be rewards, there will be a future. Everything I do in my body here is preparing me for what I do in my body there. Everything in the Lord here is useful for my future in the next world. I'd, I'd just love to get hold of the author of Ecclesiastes. I wish he was sitting here in the congregation. I wish I could just take him and say, read this chapter. Read about the resurrection of the body. Know what's going to happen to a person when they die. And you would not say life is useless. Listen finally to a word from the last book in the Bible. Here it is, right from the book of Revelation. Happy are those who from now on die in the service of the Lord. They will enjoy rest from their hard work because the results of their service go with them. That's the Christian hope. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for sharing with us this great secret that we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And these mortal souls will put on immortal bodies. Lord, so many people seem to believe that immortal souls must put off mortal bodies, but we believe because you have said that mortal souls shall put on immortal bodies. But Lord, we realize that this hope is for those who are in Christ, that outside of him that resurrection can bring nothing but shame and contempt and suffering. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you will bring into Christ every life here. And we thank you now that one day we'll meet in glory with bodies. We'll see each other we'll see the blessed body of our Lord Jesus Christ and we'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. But we thank you now that he rose from the dead, that the tomb was empty and that he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.